Welcome to Loving Dementia Care, a series of talks sponsored by the UCSF Memory and Aging Center and the San Francisco's Institute on Aging. This conference is in its ninth year and is held annually around Valentine's Day, hence the title of the conference and the specific talks. I want to review a few housekeeping details before introducing our speakers for today. I'm Jennifer Merrilies, and I'm a nurse at the Memory and Aging Center, and I'll be moderating today. If you have a question for our speakers, please write it in the Q&A section, which you can find by hovering at the bottom of the screen and then clicking on the Q&A button. We will have time at the end of today's talk to answer some of the questions. We are providing American Sign Language interpretation today. This talk is being recorded and will be available on the Memory and Aging Center and Institute, Institution on Aging websites, which I will put into the chat. At the end of today's talk, we will put a link to a course evaluation in the chat and welcome your constructive feedback. To receive these, participants must complete the evaluation. It takes about 10 working days to get them. And if anyone has questions about this, feel free to contact Catlin Morgan, Education Manager at the IOA, and I'll put her email in the chat as well. Now, if you don't look at the chat today, please do not worry. Everyone's going to get a follow up email with all the links that I've just mentioned. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Nat Bowie is a nurse practitioner and Manor Alawala is a care team navigator in our care ecosystem program. Both are with the Memory and Aging Center. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming to our webinar virtually. Um, uh, so I'll just again introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nat Bowie. I'm a nurse practitioner here at the Memory and Aging Center. Hi, and I'm Manor Alawala. As Jennifer said, I'm a care team navigator at the Memory and Aging Clinic. Great. And so I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, to start, we'll be uh, going through a case study um, to describe the stages of dementia. Uh, we will be identifying uh, common needs associated with each stage. Um, uh, we will discuss resources and strategies that are useful and um, are, that are commonly used. Um, Manor uh, will be providing additional information into our case study throughout. We have permission from the patient's family um, to share their story and their pictures. So first, I would like to review how we think about dementia care over time. So as dementia progresses, the goals of care changes and are used to guide the interventions that are provided by professionals and caregivers and families. In order to do this, um, we recommend having regular assessments and re-evaluation of where the patient is in terms of their cognitive and functional abilities and how that affects their goals of care. As the person with dementia progresses from mild through moderate to severe or late stage of the disease, the focus changes from prolongation of life to maintaining function and then maximizing comfort. Even after death, we want to provide the family and caregivers with grief and bereavement support. So here's an overview of the areas that we assess throughout the different stages of dementia. We want to ensure that the patients and caregivers are educated on dementia, the disease progression and course over time. We'd like to connect them to counseling services um, that there are available to help both the patient and caregivers on managing and coping with the different changes and potential challenges. We often refer to community-based resources and organizations like the Institute on Aging, Family Caregiver Alliance, um, and the Alzheimer's Association. Um, we often connect uh, 
people with home-based support resources um, in terms of hiring in-home caregivers, um, home health services like physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, there are also house calls practices for primary care that are available um, and that you know, caregivers and families can utilize. There are common questions about facility placement. So we often refer to resources like placement advisors to provide support and guiding families through the transitions of care. We always like to discuss financial and legal planning um, for arranging durable power of attorney, um, any type of fiduciary services or even conservatorship. So we hope that these interventions can improve the quality of dementia care um, to to reduce patient suffering and improve their quality of life, to delay functional decline, to reduce and ease caregiver burden, and overall reduce kind of the public cost of their care. So a little bit about um, caregivers, um, which we all know are the backbone for dementia care. Um, informal caregivers like family members, friends, and even unpaid caregivers provide some level of care, including assistance with instrumental activities of daily living, like helping with household chores, shopping, preparing meals or personal activities of daily living, like dressing, bathing, grooming, and feeding. So we know informal caregivers provide some level of care for more than 90% of people receiving their care at home. We know that approximately 75% of caregivers are women. It is more common for wives to provide care and over one third of caregivers are daughters. Caregiving can also affect one's health and often caregivers are at higher risk for developing cardiovascular disease um, like hypertension, um, high risk for developing depression, anxiety due to high levels of stress. Because of this, caregivers are often high risk of, of dying before their loved ones with dementia. And to add into the caregiver uh, group, you know, professional paid caregivers, um, as well as you know, healthcare professionals uh, share in the challenges associated with caring for someone with dementia. So I would like you to in, uh, meet our patient. Um, this is Mr. D. He was a 65 year old man with history of hypertension, diabetes and sleep apnea. He was a teacher, a skier, patrolman, paramedic and a fireman. Um, in 2013, he started to have some memory issues um, after a major surgery and his cognitive symptoms at the time were mild um, but progressively worsened. He, uh, because of his diabetes, he was on insulin and he was forgetting to give himself the correct dose of insulin. He became more apathetic, less motivated in his previous hobbies. He had visual spatial difficulties like getting lost while he was driving. And he had, and he had a hard time following TV shows or sports games. So because of this, his wife, um, noticed uh, this and uh, advocated for him to have a medical evaluation for these cognitive changes. He was initially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, but later um, changed to uh, uh, having uh, been diagnosed with frontal temporal um, dementia. And you'll see based on some of the symptoms that we'll talk about um, why that was. Um, he was started initially on Denepazil and then moved on to Memantine and Escitalopram, which is an antidepressant. Within a year of his diagnosis, he showed continual progression and decline. He lost some more of his functional independence. So his wife was taking care of all the chores, managing their finances. She was mainly doing all the cooking, the cleaning and managing his medications, especially his insulin. He continued to drive, but only to familiar and routine locations like visiting his mother once a week on his own. So in the mild stage, some issues that we like to think about um, is disclosure. So um, some people uh, in this time have difficulty and challenges in, in, around deciding who to tell um, and how to tell their friends and family about their diagnosis. 
Um, many people are hesitant um, due to concerns about how others will respond, um, as well as stigma due to the diagnosis. And so, um, you know, we recommend um, telling your close friends and family and uh, hopefully being able to reassure them that, you know, they are not alone in going through this disease um, and that they will have support um, around them. Another challenge is how to balance autonomy with risk. So it's important to maintain um, independence, some level of independence, but also uh, putting safety systems in place to protect the person. So for example, you know, while our patient was still driving, he did have episodes of getting lost. So um, he was mainly driving only to routine places um, that he knows how to get to and back um, and maybe not traveling to unfamiliar places on his own. Um, even after diagnosis, it can be difficult to accept the diagnosis and no two patients um, cope and, and deal with it the same way. It often takes time to accept the diagnosis. And so we like to offer you know, flexibility and open communication to provide reassurance to them and their families that they're not facing this diagnosis alone. Um, having a you know, limited insight or limited awareness of cognitive decline is a common feature of Alzheimer's disease and is often more than just denial. So often we have to um, support the caregiver and the family in how to uh, discuss the diagnosis and to uh, continue to uh, monitor how, how much insight the person has. Um, in terms of behavioral symptoms, uh, obviously I think uh, behavioral changes can occur. Uh, depression and anxiety are very common in the early to middle stages. Um, experts estimate that 40% of people with Alzheimer's disease suffer from significant depression. It can present differently um, and can usually present as disruption in appetite or sleep, um, agitation or slowed behavior. Um, the person may be more irritable, more tired, and the presence of anxiety symptoms is additionally associated with a lower quality of life um, and it can really impact uh, activities of daily living. So I wanted to ask Manor here, kind of in the mild stage, you know, for our patient and his wife, you know, how did they disclose to their friends and family and kind of what was the response like? Yeah, so um, the wife wanted to be open and honest with their close friends and family about his diagnosis and how that might change how he is over time. So his siblings lived close by, but they didn't visit as often as she would have liked. And in particular, his male friends stopped coming by. I think they didn't fully understand the disease or how to engage with him. They knew him as someone who was very outgoing and very capable, but now they saw he was less communicative, more apathetic, and sometimes said inappropriate things or jokes, and they, they just didn't know how to be around him. Yeah. Um, and did she have any safety concerns, um, and how did she support him in maintaining his independence? Yeah, so as you mentioned, the driving was a big safety concern. Um, so he would get lost while going to unfamiliar places like the dentist, but she allowed him to drive to the grocery store or to his mother's house. But eventually she did end up taking his keys away. She had concerns about leaving him in the car alone. Even for five minutes, he would um, get confused and leave the car and try to go look for her. Even when they went to restaurants, he would get lost on the way back from the bathroom and couldn't find his table. So she made it a point to actually always carry a recent picture of him and the outfit he was wearing that day so that if he was to get lost, it would be easy to find him and identify him. Um, there were a few instances, like you mentioned, where he gave himself the wrong dose of insulin. So she took over that and all other medication management right away. And luckily for this patient, um, he was aware of the limitations and restrictions that others had put on him for his safety. And he was receptive to that, which was a blessing. Great. Okay. So in, in the mild stage, you know, we want to assess kind of what the caregiver's current knowledge of dementia uh, is, um, its progression um, and, you know, uh, 
let her know about care options and resources, as well as understanding potential limits of care. We assess for health literacy or the level of health literacy um, to see if there are any factors or barriers to obtaining, processing, and understanding health information um, in order to make informed decisions about care. Especially, um, it's also important to assess for the uh, level of caregiver burden um, and the stress which is perceived by the caregivers um, and what their network of social support is like. You know, we know that a caregiver with a higher level of burden can negatively affect the patient's care. We also um, want to be mindful about um, ethnic and cultural factors. So we need to discuss, you know, who is expected to provide care? You know, how is dementia perceived? How are important decisions made? Who implements these decisions? And what is not being said? Um, we, so we know that caregiving um, can uh, impact the person with dementia as well as the caregiver. Um, so I'm just going to go back just a little bit here um, for a second. Um, and so we want to assess the, the areas of strengths as well as areas of risks and needs that can improve caregiver well-being, um, their self-efficacy, their self-care, and to support better outcomes. So um, Manor, kind of what was her understanding of dementia and his disease? Yeah, so um, his memory problems actually started early on many years before a formal diagnosis was made. So initially she was trying to see if his memory problems were due to reversible cardiovascular factors. Um, but once the diagnosis was made and those factors were ruled out, he continued to progress. And she understood the progressive nature of the disease, but it was difficult to come to terms with, especially because over time, she saw how he was unable to do so many of the things that he was once an expert at. And it was particularly difficult for her to grasp that someone who looked healthy on the outside actually had something completely different going on on the inside. And what did she need help with in this kind of early and mild stage and what was most helpful to her? Yeah, so she needed to identify what things he was able to do and what she needed help with. So she needed help with managing his insulin treatment for his diabetes and taking over medication management. She had to step in and take over the finances, bill paying, organizing his schedule, even picking out what outfits he had to wear that day. So it was, it was a lot for her to do. Um, she attended educational classes through the Alzheimer's Association and Family Caregiver Alliance. And she found those to be really helpful in learning what to expect as the disease progresses. Um, she decided to hire a caregiver um, at this stage because she felt he needed more supervision than she could provide and also someone to provide companionship for him. Um, so that he wouldn't spend all his time sitting in front of the TV and not having um, any social stimulation. Yeah. And were there any other factors that impacted her perception of being a caregiver? Yeah, so she, she saw what it took to take care of her dad and she knew that she needed to retire early to take care of her husband full time. He needed help with a lot of daily activities and supervision and she knew that she had to adjust her expectations of what he was able to do and how to be there to support him. Great. So um, like Manor said, you know, uh, we often refer to the Alzheimer's Association for disease and dementia education. Um, they're really, they have great handouts and resources on explaining kind of the, the, the type of dementia, the effects on the brain, cognition, and even behavioral changes. Um, Caregiver support can also be found through support groups um, and, uh, and, and, and other community resources like the Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, we also like to refer to counseling uh, resources as well for emotional support. And you know, we like to provide information on legal planning. So completing durable power of attorney, updating trusts or wills, um, completing advanced care planning. Um, and we often refer to the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform or CANR. Um, it's a great resource for uh, getting in touch with an elder law attorney or for legal assistance. Um, 
you know, we recognize, especially in the, in the early stage, it's important to not overwhelm the caregiver and the patient with all, a lot of this information. I um, mean, often be given kind of a dose type of way um, through follow-up visits or, you know, regular um, contact with the caregiver and the patient. So um, as we go, go through 2014 and 2015, um, our patient continued to decline in his personal care activities. Um, his wife, like when I said, began to hire in-home caregivers for help as well as for respite for herself. Um, she started attending a caregiver support group initially. Um, she noticed that he you know, was starting to have difficulty want needing uh, remembering to brush his teeth or to shave if she didn't remind him to um, he would wear the same clothes if she didn't ask him to change um, he became more child childlike he had a loss of filter when he was around others in social situations um, he would approach strangers trying to kiss them or hug them he was more disinhibited um, he even asked her one time are you my sister um, so he was kind of not recognizing her um, he was more uh, more rigid. He had less empathy and less ability to uh, express sympathy. He liked repetitive activities like collecting leaves or folding clothes, um, but may not always stay on task. Um, he was more disoriented uh, and had no sense of time. I think in 2016, he began to wander and there were more concerns about his safety. Um, he, you know, was eating a lot more and, and was not able to kind of know when to stop. And, you know, around this time, he began to exhibit more behavioral challenges around toileting and bathing and changing. Um, so that just increased the need for uh, additional caregivers in the home to help her. So additionally, you know, in 2016, his wife uh, began to see a personal counselor uh, every month for additional support. Um, she often said that she just wants the house to herself sometimes. Um, she took up Zumba for exercise and as a, as a way as a, of a break and to spend some time out of the house. Um, in 2017, he began to be more disinhibited, you know, um, and he had more trouble with his speech. So he had aphasia or difficulty speaking. His speech was less understandable. Um, he was confused with using utensils, not being able to figure out how to use a fork and knife. Um, in 2018, uh, he had increased wandering at night with sleep disturbances and worsening incontinence. His gait was starting to decline around this time. Um, he would shuffle his feet and start to need to use a walker to ambulate. At this point, the caregivers uh, were coming to help every single day. So in the moderate stage, um, there needs to be more assistance with bathing, dressing, and other personal activities of daily living. Um, we recommend these uh, videos that provide some strategies and tips that caregivers can use. Um, Tipa Snow is uh, someone we often refer to. Um, she's an occupational therapist and she founded a company called Positive Approach to Care. And she provides you know, great education and training on dementia caregiving, uh, focused on non-pharmacological techniques on how to manage challenging behaviors. So her videos are available online. Um, and so, Manor, kind of what were some of her biggest concerns um, during the stage for our patient? Yeah, so the wife's, um, one of her biggest concerns was finding meaningful activities to keep him engaged during the day. So if she didn't have anything planned for him, he would be very content sitting on the couch all day watching TV. So she wanted him to have more stimulation. So she tried to figure out his interests and maximize those. So as you mentioned, he loved sweeping and raking leaves. So she'd encourage him to do that more often and even gave him a little bag to collect his leaves. So when they would walk outside, he would collect them and then arrange them in patterns later. And this served as an enjoyable activity for them both and as a way to connect. Um, at this time, there was also a switch in her hired caregivers, and it was a little difficult bringing the new ones up to speed with his diabetes care. So um, she felt uneasy leaving them home alone to manage his diabetes. Um, her, their friends continued to withdraw from them, and they continued that the isolation became more and more prominent um, since they didn't know how to engage with him. And during this stage, she decided that she wanted to take care of some of the end of life issues like funeral planning and 
deciding whether to donate his brain to autopsy. And this was a great and proactive approach from the wife's end, but these were difficult topics to talk about and they required um, ongoing conversations and support. Yeah. Um, and then how was she kind of managing the incontinence care and some of the behavioral symptoms? Yeah, incontinence was a big issue. So he urinated everywhere um, in people's garbage cans, down the hallway. So she began to put red tape on the toilet so that he would know where to urinate. And she removed all the trash cans from their house. Um, she experimented with various incontinence supplies to find ones that were most absorbent for nighttime and wouldn't leak through so that she would save time um, by not doing multiple loads of laundry. In public places, she actually began to take him to the women's restroom with her, and she used it as an opportunity to educate other women in there about his disease and how he needed help with toileting. Um, he was sometimes resistant to taking pills and he would refuse to swallow them. So they began to crush them and mix them in his pudding. Um, he would get angry and agitated sometimes when her, when she or the caregiver helped with personal care or when they pricked his finger to measure his blood sugar. Um, but both her and the caregiver were really good about redirecting him and also always talking to him in a calm, reassuring voice. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the resources that she found to be most helpful and what do you think would have maybe helped her more? Yeah, so she really maximized her respite care by increasing the hours of in-home care so that she was able to take care of herself and participate in Rotary and connect with her friends. Um, she continued to meet with her counselor and that was very helpful in reassuring her that she was doing everything possible to provide good care for her husband and also cope with the ongoing disease progression. Um, I think an adult day program would have been really beneficial and she did explore this option, but there were no programs in her area that could manage his complex diabetes care. Thanks. So kind of in the moderate stage, you know, we reviewed some of the strategies um, that we often use. So if it's not already been discussed, you know, uh, we like to address uh, financial or legal planning, um, including completing durable power of attorney, um, consolidating assets or bank accounts and access to funds. Um, family caregivers can also apply for a family medical leave or California paid family leave. Um, there are also home-based interventions so like our caregiver did hiring uh, in-home caregivers, um, we can also refer for physical therapy and occupational therapy for home safety evaluations, especially since he was starting to have more shuffling gait and needing to use his walker. Um, other community-based resources um, include maybe a one-time caregiver respite grant, um, home delivered meals, um, as well as transport services if he needed help going to a medical appointment or if there was an adult day program that he was going to. Um, we also want to provide more psychoeducation and support for the caregiver um, as they're learning on how to respond to behavioral symptoms. And, and, and again, kind of reminding them to focus on their well being. We like to give up the Alzheimer's Association 24 7 hotline number. Um, and, and the Alzheimer's Associations, they have great caregiver workshops, counseling, and trainings, um, as well as individual counseling. Um, for safety, we like to recommend using either a medic alert bracelet or some type of GPS tracker, especially in this case where our, our patient was wandering a lot either at night or during the day um, to help facilitate a safe return or if they have a medical emergency. Um, like when I said, we like to offer adult day programs um, if they're available where they can socialize with others um, and participate in engaging activities and allows for respite for the caregiver and the other hired caregivers. Um, and I think, you know, finally, you know, facility placement is something, you know, if it comes up and we, we can discuss with the caregivers and refer them to placement advisors or to start the process with providing maybe some recommendations in their area, if that's something that they are interested in or part of their um, kind of care planning. So Manor, for our caregiver, were there any financial issues around affording caregivers? Yeah, so um, she used private caregivers that she found by word of mouth, and she worked with an accountant to, um, to manage their payroll and tax documents. 
And later on, she did switch over to an agency and she found it was a relief that they took over some of these logistics. Um, as his care needs increased and um, when he start, started to need overnight care, she did worry about the costs of care increasing. And she always mentioned to me that she wished there was some sort of tax benefit for family caregivers. Mm -hmm. And I know, uh, you know, you started to work with her maybe a little bit after this time, but during this time, how were you able to support her through the behavioral challenges and kind of focus on her well-being as a caregiver? Yeah, so I will say the caregiver was really great at adjusting her expectations of her husband and using his abilities to engage him in activities that both of them enjoyed and used as a way to connect. Um, she stopped asking, why can't he do this? Um, each time he was unable to follow her directions or if he had um, an incontinence episode and she attributed it to disease progression. Um, she knew early on that she had to adjust herself because he was unable to change. And she, had, she admitted that if she was working full time while caregiving, she would have had a harder time managing his behaviors and really understanding what his care needs were. She, um, she found it helpful to journal her thoughts and take as many pictures of him as possible to remember him by. She understood the importance of taking breaks for herself and she started participating in Zumba, which was really fun for her. Um, it, it was an ongoing process to deal with his loss of function and disease progression. And in particular, the loss of connection was really hard to deal with and not being able to have conversations like they used to, but she found new ways to connect with him, like holding his hands um, or dancing together to music, which was really nice. And did she ever consider placement at all? She did consider placement and she explored local options, um, but she found that she was, she liked the in-home caregivers and she found she was getting adequate respite through them. And she felt that could work. And she also worried that the staff at facilities wouldn't be able to manage his diabetes or provide him individualized attention. So as we kind of go through um, in 2018, um, he started to decline a lot more. So he had repeated falls, um, needing to be hospitalized for diabetes related complications. Um, he was eventually stopped on the denepazil and uh, but continued the memantine. Uh, he was hospitalized for pneumonia and was discharged briefly for, to a skilled nursing facility. Um, when she visited him, she felt really guilty about him being there um, and said, you know, what have I done? Um, he was a lot weaker, he was unable to walk, and again, like Lenore said, his diabetes management was pretty complex. Um, so I, I, I believe she, um, to, you know, had him, it was only there for a brief stay after the hospitalization, so she, they discharged home. He had another hospitalization in later in late 2018, um, and he developed an ulcer on his foot. Um, he became more bed bound and she needed a hospital bed and a Hoyer lift. Um, hospice was discussed with her at this time and he was eventually referred. So this is a picture of him um, in the kind of later stage and she, you know, with his Hoyer lift and it, you know, um, she said that I feel like my world is shrinking. His life is the bed and the wheelchair and that's it. Um, everyone keeps telling me what a great job I'm doing, but nothing is going to change the fact that he's declining. So um, as we head towards kind of uh, 2020 uh, with COVID, you know, hospice was only able to come out once every two weeks and there were difficulties with keeping hired caregivers. Um, uh, he was sleeping most of the day uh, very nonverbal and bed bound. Um, they were still able to take him out for walks in his wheelchair. Um, he had, you know, increasing difficulty with the communication. There are obviously changes in his physical abilities, including the ability to walk and sit. And eventually, um, as we'll know, he needed a lot more help with feeding and, and his meals as well. And for her, it sounds like her sleep was being disrupted because she had to wake up a few times a night to change his position. And, and she was pretty concerned about the COVID risks um, with the hired caregivers and kind of finding new people. So, uh, you know, we really like this quote here that she said, you know, life is a tree losing its leaves at the season of life. 
I just keep staying in the present and not going backward and forward in my mind about how it used to be and what is facing me in front. So um, during the week leading up to his death, you know, he had increasing rigidity and stiffness. He was sleeping all the time, non-responsive, um, wasn't eating, had lost a lot of weight. Um, she commented how he, he's gotten so tiny. Um, and so, you know, he passed away um, in October, 2020. So I, this video is no longer available, but there are other Tipa Snow links uh, on YouTube and online um, for how to um, help caregivers with feeding and hydrating at the later stages um, as well. Oh, that's what I, right, exactly. Um, okay, so um, in the later stage, uh, we again want to revisit the goals of care and kind of discuss uh, and what type of therapies we want to continue. So for example, you know, he stopped the denepazil and he stopped the memantine. Maybe there were other discussions about the medical treatments that he was on, the medications that he was on. Um, we want to discuss uh, the care plan and introduce palliative care or hospice care. Um, so again, palliative care is a specialized uh, medical care for people with living, living with a serious illness um, and is focused on kind of relief from the symptoms of the disease and improving the quality of life or focusing more on the quality of life for both the patient and their families. Um, the palliative care can often transition into hospice care, you know, if the providers believe that the person is likely to die within six months. Um, and hospice can be provided in the home, in a facility, you know, inpatient as well. Um, and so, like our patient, he was referred to hospice, um, uh, and you know, it, I think he was on it for um, about a year or so, I believe. Uh, um, and you know, we also want to make sure that we complete the pulse or the physician's orders of life-sustaining treatment as well. Um, this can happen, uh, you know, before the later stages, but also definitely as we near the late stage, we want to make sure that it's completed. Um, Often at this time, patients will require 24 seven care, either in home, in a facility, um, with hospice or on hospice. Um, we wanna continue providing caregiver support um, with grief counseling and funeral planning. So luckily I think our caregiver, like Lana was said, had already planned this out ahead of time and kind of already knew what she wanted. Um, and so I'm wondering how was she kind of coping in the late stage with his physical decline and increased needs? Yeah, so um, it was really up and down, um, particularly when she realized he wouldn't be able to walk again. That was really difficult to cope with. Um, she felt encouraged when his eyes lit up and they watched their favorite show, The Voice, together, um, or when he'd eat a full meal. Um, she often struggled with what his life had come to and how much ability he'd lost, um, especially when she would look at old photos. Um, she, she found peace knowing that he was happy, comfortable, and well cared for at home. She actually ended up reducing the hours of care at home um, because um, when she was home all the time, when COVID started, um, she wanted to maximize their time together and figured she didn't need as much in-home care. Um, and of course, the isolation continued to increase with COVID because um, no one was able to visit during that time. So that was that was really challenging. And uh, I know just from a little bit of background from this case, you know, how did she respond to the referral to hospice, um, and how did she feel about it? And, and after receiving the services, yeah. So um, I think when the word hospice comes up, um, it can have a negative connotation for people and almost scare them. So it was first brought up, I think, in late late 2018, after um, his series of multiple hospitalizations, when he could no longer walk and he developed this pressure sore on his foot. Um, the caregiver found it was really helpful to talk to hospice first to understand how they could help. And she felt more accepting of their services. Um, when she discovered that it wouldn't limit his care. So for example, she could still call 911. Um, she also realized that hospice could help care for the pressure ulcer on his foot um, since that was beginning to worsen and it was causing him quite a bit of pain when they were transferring him. And kind of what helped her in the active and kind of delayed grieving process through this late stage? 
Yeah, um, the grieving process was ongoing since for the last few years, um, she'd really centered her time, all her time around caring for him. So it took some time to, to find herself again. Um, she continued to meet with her counselor and that was very helpful. And she met with the hospice chaplain a few times as well, but she felt it was easier to talk to people who had been involved with their journey from the early stages. Um, she, she found small moments of joy. So for example, when he would, he would eat a lamb chop by himself or um, when they would go for walks around the neighborhood um, with him in his wheelchair and both of them wearing masks. And when the neighbors were able to wave hi to him, that was, that was enjoyable for her. Um, and at this stage, she continued to take lots and lots of pictures and videos of him to just remember every moment with him. And the good thing was, was that, as you mentioned, the funeral planning and all had been done in the earlier stages of the disease. So she didn't spend as much time thinking about death and the logistics of what to do after. Um, and she was able to focus more on just being there with him in the moment. So it, just to kind of summarize our case, especially for our caregiver, you know, it sounds she was able to educate herself um, on the disease progression, um, it, though it took some time to maybe accept and come to terms with it. Um, she, she definitely did. Um, and she was uh, kind of coping with the changes throughout the different stages. Um, she was able to kind of identify his goals of care early on, especially with the complex diabetes management and then having the hospitalizations and then the, the pressure ulcer on his foot. I think all those kind of really impacted his care and, and kind of made, uh, she made decisions around that as well. Um, and she really focused on the in-home care. Um, so having hired caregivers, um, and she was able to plan ahead. You know, she really thought about um, the future and she really thought about the, the funeral planning so that she was able to kind of, like you said, kind of focus more on the present um, and, and um, making memories with him that she can look back on and, you know, all the videos and photos that she took. She recognized the need for self-care as a caregiver early on. Um, she found opportunities and ways to get respite. So through the hired caregivers, through Zumba, seeing her counselor, um, connecting with friends or family, um, and having the hired caregivers there really helped. Um, she found meaningful activities for him and ways to engage him, you know, even uh, at home. So, it, you know, uh, often the day program is available, but at home, she was able to find ways for him to stay active. So raking the leaves, you know, the coffee parties that they would have. Um, and it's great that he was able to have some socialization with the different caregivers that she was bringing in. Um, she utilized community resources like the Family Caregiver Alliance, medical transportation services, um, hospice thrift store for the durable uh, medical equipment um, for him, you know, having the hospital bed and the lift um, was were really helpful given his functional decline and physical decline at the time. Um, and, you know, enrolling in hospice was a difficult decision, um, but it, that took months to come to term with, but um, it, she was able to process the grief that was ongoing um, and she was able to establish a support network to seek help. Um, so overall, you know, I think some of the strategies that we discussed, she was able to utilize throughout. So, as dementia care providers, you know, getting our grounding, I think self-care goes beyond just the fundamental basic needs of sleep and food and exercise. Um, I think that's um, uh, seeking out support through counseling services, um, or friends and family in our social network, um, and also uh, respite time for ourselves um, through journaling um, and even um, doing activities that kind of document what's going on. So through the videos and pictures that she took. Um, it's important to find a balance between um, the personal work life. So it doesn't sound like she was working, but you know, if caregivers who are still working um, and having to uh, kind of balance between being a caregiver and, and working, but also, you know, as a caregiver, that is a job. So having to balance, you know, personal time for yourself and time that you're dedicating to being a caregiver. Um, it's always important to kind of honor and nurture different relationships and our emotional needs and creative needs and spiritual needs um, so that we provide ourselves that time and space um, to explore those different needs and, and, and fulfill those. 
it's also important to know kind of when to consult or ask for help. So our caregiver was really savvy in the beginning, you know, knowing kind of um, where to seek the different resources and the different um, support systems um, through FCA or other organizations. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't talk a, a lot about her, about the medical providers, but I'm sure, I'm sure with his medical conditions like the diabetes, the pressure ulcer, um, uh, and his functional and, and physical decline, she definitely, you know, needed to uh, include the medical providers in that as well. And then often setting and revisiting intentions, you know, why do we do what we do can be really helpful. So I think all the quotes that we had kind of picked out really show that she was really um, kind of trying to be mindful of where she was at through different stages of this journey um, and kind of allowing herself to reflect uh, ongoing and even now um, after his death of, of how, how it was for her as a caregiver and what it was like and starting to process um, through her experience. So, you know, in summary, uh, although the timing varies and there is a progressive decline in dementia that allows for kind of a logical approach to counseling and providing support care, um, you know, we know that dementia caregiving is challenging for both professional and informal caregivers. Um, there are interventions and resources that can support caregivers in providing dementia care um, to either their loved ones or, you know, in a professional capacity. And so we, we hope that through this case study and kind of examining the different resources and strategies um, that you'll be able to utilize some of this in your work as well. So we wanted to close with this quote from Jill, um, our patient's wife. Um, it is incumbent on us who care for or have a relationship with someone who has dementia to create opportunities for connection. Isolation is painful for both individuals. To further open ourselves to look for and receive the slightest example of a response and enjoyment. In my relationship, it was a smile, a raised eyebrow, a sound when speech was gone, a squeeze of the hand, and most assuredly, a deep appreciation in his eyes. Share life with them and keep communication and laughter daily mission. So I, I, we, I want to say thank you to Jill. Um, we really appreciate her um, sharing her story um, and you know their story together. So I'll say thank you. Um, and we'll open it up for Q&A. That was great. Um, thank you both, Nat and Manor, for that really great case study. Um, got a couple comments about what an amazing caregiver Jill was during all that time. Um, one, one, we've got a few questions. Um, one is about, um, curious about this, the man's um, other family members, friends um, who were connected with him sort of before he had dementia and um, a little bit more if, if you know about what extent that they sort of fell away from him um, once he became ill and if you have any more details to share about that. Yeah, so um, he had an extensive um, friend circle, I think, because he was kind of a jack of all trades. So he had a lot of friends in like skiing and from his work and from his teaching days. Um, he did have one son who um, had his own kind of, um, he, he was busy with work and had his own stuff to deal with. So for a time frame, his son and him, there, there were some lapses in communication because it was difficult for him to process the diagnosis and how his dad was progressing, but um, eventually he did make it a point to communicate more often and visit more often. But um, he had other friends and family close by and it was difficult for them to um, communicate with them or know how to engage him. So they kind of um, visited less and less and less and eventually stopped um, being super involved. So. It strikes me that that's another burden for the caregiver in a way to um, deal with the isolation, but then also maybe to feel like they're responsible for sort of coaching people on how to interact with someone with dementia. Right. And one time um, she did mention that there was a friend who came over and she invented this game called Battle Spa, where she bought two paddles and she had a big ball 
and they would just throw the ball back and forth with the paddles. So one time she had a friend come over and she asked him to play that with her husband and it actually turned out to be really great. So she always tried to find ways where if someone did come visit, how they would be able to engage with, with her husband. Amazing, amazing. And then um, we had a question about music and singing and you had mentioned that the wife they would dance to certain music together. That was part of the pastime. And can you talk a little bit more about that or just either for both of you, your experiences with how music and singing and dancing is sort of part of um, care? Yeah, um, so music was a big part of his care. And um, I think I mentioned like right to the end stages, he loved watching the boys. Um, that was one of his favorite shows and the songs in Moana, he would, his eyes would light up and they would um, come on. Um, and before when he was walking, um, they would make it a point to dance almost every day. And that was more of, um, it, it served two purposes. One, it was really fun and two, it was a good way for him to get physical activity. Um, so yeah, yeah, and I think music is often, especially for um, for him, he might have had a more more aphasia in the later in the moderate to late stages where he was having difficulty speaking, and so um, music can often be very therapeutic. Um, and even though he couldn't sing the words anymore, I think being able to uh, have some familiarity with the song um, that that gave him some enjoyment as well. And so I think we often uh, see if, if music, it, because music doesn't rely a lot on, you know, uh, visual spatial skills or kind of um, physical skills. And it's something that um, can help them reflect and maybe bring back some memories from the past. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and it, it, you gave so many wonderful examples of how the wife, um, how Jill um, connected with her husband in ways she found connection. Um, how about the hired caregivers? Um, were there sort of specific ways that they connected with him and, and how, did, how did that work? Yeah, so um, I think it took a, a while to figure out um, how they would be able to connect with them. And the wife was really good about encouraging the hired caregivers to participate in these activities that she found for him. So like this game that she invented and also dancing with him, their morning coffee parties. Um, she really encouraged them to kind of see him beyond the disease and try to connect with them on what he enjoys. Um, so, um, so things like folding clothes, arranging pens, taking him for walks so he could collect his leaves and encouraging him to draw it out in a pattern, those types of things. Um, she, she encouraged them to, um, to be able to do those things with him. Yeah. And, and I think it's all about kind of modifying the different activities to, um, his abilities, right? So obviously doing puzzles might've been too difficult for him or playing a card game might've been too difficult, but the wife was able to educate the hired caregivers on what his current abilities are so that they can meet him where he's at um, and do some, doing activities that are not too challenging for him or you know, kind of meeting him exactly where he's at in the, on the level of, of, of kind of what he needed. Mm -hmm. That's great, wonderful. Um, I had a question about paying for care and you gave some examples, I think near the end talked about, she used the thrift store to find some of the medical equipment that she wanted. Can, can you talk a little bit more about how she dealt with the cost of um, all of this in-home care? Yeah, so um, it, it, it was a lot, I think, as his care needs increased, the cost of course went up and she, she would actively try not to think about it because she almost felt guilty that he needed the care and she didn't want to think about how the cost was adding up but um, she did try to cut down where she, where she could so she did discover this hospice thrift store and that was a great way to get um, I think she got shower chairs through them or a walker and that was really helpful for her and when she was home um, when the pandemic started she did decide to cut back on care um, because she felt that he didn't need as much and she was home and able to provide that for him. Um, during the first few years of his illness, um, she used private caregivers. So that was a much more affordable option for her. And when she switched to an agency, that's when she kind of reduced the hours of care because it was more expensive. Um, yeah. Great. 
Um, and then um, what did she appreciate the most about the caregivers when she had them, do you think? I think, so she really liked every one of her caregivers. Um, I think she really appreciated how they were able to connect with him and how well he responded to them. So um, during the early stages when he was able to walk, he used to really enjoy their first caregiver who would dance with him and take him out for walks. And, um, and then gradually as he progressed, the other ones were still able to engage with him. And Jill, Jill would just say that he was very responsive to them um, and really enjoyed their company. So she felt comfortable leaving them, leaving him home alone with these caregivers. Um, one of the caregivers would actually bring her four-year-old daughter to the house and the husband really enjoyed um, her company and playing with her. So she almost felt like they were family because of um, how much attention they gave him and how much they connected with him. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, also a question about um, his time with hospice and did he, how long was he in hospice? Did he ever, we all have had patients that sort of get disenrolled um, from hospice and then maybe re-enter hospice later. Can, did that happen with him or what was that trajectory like? Yeah, so I think he was put on hospice in, um, I think March or April of 2019. And he was on it through his death, which was in October 2020. And luckily, he wasn't, he didn't graduate from hospice or anything. So he was able to stay on it the full year, year and a half. Great. Um, and uh, did she ever sort of give up? Um, did she worry about being able to continue to care for him? And I guess a question about her, but just maybe also for caregivers that you've worked with for both of you? Um, has that happened where caregivers feel like they just can't keep doing it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think as much as she loved him and how much she really cared for him, there were definitely moments where it, 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 it was a lot to deal with and she did almost feel like giving up because um, he she'd been going through this for years since 2013. So it was seven years. Um, sorry, I think I cut out. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so she'd been going through it for a while. So there are definitely moments. And I think when she would have those moments, it would almost be a trigger to her that, okay, I, I do need a bit more time off. I need to participate in my Zumba more. Um, I need to go out for walks more often or connect with other people. So she used those as kind of triggers to self-check and um, take care of herself better. I, th I think it's an, an ongoing kind of very common recurring sentiment, I think, as a caregiver kind of goes through this journey. Um, you know, we've, I've seen caregivers who feel very overwhelmed um, through the different stages and as uh, things start to progress and especially with the functional decline and physical de decline um, and with the incontinence care, it can seem very, it can be very overwhelming for them. Um, and like Manor said, I think recognizing kind of what are the, the signs of caregiver burnout um, and when that, you know, maybe increasing hours for their caregivers or taking a break, I think those are definitely options that we always like to keep in the front of our minds um, as to support our caregivers or family caregivers at least. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's, I, we talk about a facility placement. I think, you know, that is always uh, an option for care. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for a lot of caregivers who have difficulty kind of managing at home, I think they always kind of bring that question up and, and discuss it as well. So, and I think our caregiver, I think Jill experienced how it was going to be like when he was discharged to the SNF for, you know, after his hospitalizations. Um, and she kind of realized that she would prefer to keep him at home and, you know, can prefer to continue his care with the hired caregivers. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, one other final question, I'm not sure um, how you'd answer it, but um, Atene is wondering about, are there volunteer opportunities um, in caregiver support groups? So I think looking for a chance to be more involved in support groups and do either one of you know whether that's um, possible or not? I, I don't know. I think the Alzheimer's Association has, you know, they obviously have caregiver support groups. So I, I, think, I think you can contact them 
they might, they, you know, they have facilitator trainings and opportunities as well, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, great. Um, well, wonderful. Well, we reached um, just about the end of our time and we've gone through all the questions. So I really wanna thank our speakers today, Nat and Manor for this really great case study. We've learned a lot. And I'll just thank all the attendees for participating in our conference, um, our Loving Dementia Care. And uh, thank you for joining us. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks.